The Oracle Network. Hi, I'm Eric Carter Lundin, and you might know me from True Consequences Podcast. And I'm Alex, and you may not know me at all. And, and we, we are, are Dos, Dos Pukenos. Join us weekly as we tell you all about the paranormal in New Mexico. We will cover aliens, ghosts, and other weird happenings and phenomena. You can find Dos Pukenos wherever you get your favorite podcasts. Stay spooky, and don't forget to rate, subscribe, and review Dos Pukenos. Look for us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dos Pukenos. Peace! Hey, 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 Rainbow Warriors. This is my disclaimer. Beyond the Rainbow is a true crime podcast. It's not suitable for young children, and maybe not even for some adults. I tend to swear like a sailor, and I'm kind of proud of that. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors, and welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBT. I'm your host, CJ. I hope you all had a lovely Valentine's Day. I haven't celebrated that holiday in years. I guess the romance in my relationship with myself has just run out of steam. I haven't cheated on myself with anyone else. I still love myself, but the butterflies I used to get being alone have dissipated. If anyone has any ideas on how I can rekindle that spark in my relationship with myself, please don't hesitate to email me at beyondtherainbowpod at gmail.com. Also, if you have a case suggestion or any ideas for Rainbow Warrior merch, shoot me an email. You can find me on the socials. I'm on Facebook at Beyond the Rainbow Pod or like my page at Rainbow Crimes. I'm on Instagram at Beyond the Rainbow and Rainbow Crimes 12. And I'm on Twitter at Rainbow Crimes. And don't forget to visit my website at beyondtherainbowpodcast.com. On that site, you can find the titles of all my past episodes, see ideas I have for future episodes, and see my future collaborations with other podcasters. And you can check out the long list I have going of missing but not forgotten LGBTQ members. This episode's missing but not forgotten LGBTQ member, it's a very cold case out of Carrollton, Georgia. Brian Anthony Worrell was 39 years old when he disappeared from his parents' property in the early morning hours of September 24, 2009. The neighbors saw Brian outside in his parents' garage working on his car at 2 a.m., which wasn't unusual for Brian because he suffered from a bad case of insomnia. When the neighbor left for work at 8.30 a.m., Brian's car was gone. Brian had an appointment at the Carroll County Probate Court at 9 a.m., but he missed it. Brian was actually never seen again. Brian lived with his partner in Atlanta, Georgia, but he was staying at his parents for a few days because of heavy flooding in the area. It made the roads not safe to drive. After a quick search of Brian's parents' house, it showed that Brian's things were still there. His cell phone, the meds he took. Brian had to wear a pacemaker because he had a heart condition, and I'm assuming that's what the meds were for. Brian's clothes were all still at his parents' house. His vehicle that did leave with him was a 1992 light blue Buick LeSabre sedan, and it had Georgia license plates. And here's the weirdest thing. Brian's car was found nearly three months after his disappearance. Where it was found was over two hours from his parents' home in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I mean, for crying out loud, this was a whole other state from where Brian and his parents lived. Brian's car no longer had its Georgia plates on it either. It had Tennessee plates. Authorities figure that Brian's car was sitting in the place it was found for at least a month before it was discovered. Someone who lived near the place the car was found said they saw a tall, slender black man in his 20s park the car there sometime in October, and that man never returned to the car, and no one matching that description could be found. Foul play is suspected in this case. Brian stands 5'7", weighs 140 pounds. He's a white male with blonde hair and blue eyes. Should he be found today, he'd be 50 years old. 
Any information should be directed to the Carrollton Police Department at area code 770-834-4451. To be perfectly honest with you, Rainbow Warriors, this episode's victim tugs hard onto my heartstrings. I think it's because the young lady reminds me so much of my own daughter. It's not just because both my daughter and the victim being adorable blonde girls with big blue eyes, but the victim and my daughter both had similar aspirations and dreams. Tawny Baird, who was just 21 at the time she was murdered, still had a lifetime of new experiences ahead of her. She had dreams of living in Los Angeles and being a star. Singing was her jam. However, Tawny's dreams were annihilated by someone she loved and trusted. So let's start at the beginning and learn a little bit about Tawny's life and who she was. Tawny was born and raised in a suburb of Salt Lake City, Utah. She had two sisters and a brother. Her parents, Casey and Dana, divorced when Tawny was very young. Dana remarried, giving Tawny a new stepdad and two stepbrothers. Tawny loved animals, and she can be found in more recent photos loving on a big gray tabby cat. She had a good childhood and she was lovingly called Ladybug. Her blended family was very close, and she spent a lot of time with them. This included living with her grandma in Bountiful, Utah for a bit. That's how Tawny met one of her very best friends, Lacey. And I'd like to credit Lacey at this time for giving me so much insight into Tawny's life. Reaching out to people who knew the victim can be a little bit scary, because you know they've lost someone who meant the world to them. But as a podcaster, you do it because you want to be able to tell the victim's story as accurately as possible. So far, thankfully, no one has told me to fuck off. Lacey, if you're listening, just know how much I appreciate the information you gave me. As a teenager, Tawny did what most teenagers do. She experimented with liquor and marijuana. At the age of 17, her and a few of her friends, who were just a tiny bit older, They were 18, got busted by a cop as they sat in a car smoking weed from a bong. Tawny took the blame and ownership for all of it. She thought since she was under 18, the law wouldn't punish her as harshly. She was that friend, the friend who took one for the team because she loved her friends and she didn't want them to be in trouble. Tawny ended up having to spend some time in a youth treatment center. At this center, she met 18-year-old Victoria Mendoza. Tawny, who was vivacious, bubbly, fun, loved to tease and joke around with people, was the polar opposite of introverted, withdrawn, and reserved Victoria. But they somehow were attracted to each other, kind of like the moth to the flame. Tawny had never been in a same-sex relationship before Victoria. She had plenty of guy friends and had boyfriends previously but something drew her to Victoria. Possibly it was the vulnerability she felt being away from her family and friends. The young women bonded over music. Broody Victoria would write lyrics and Tawny would sing them. After several months of being in the facility with Victoria, Tawny was released. Her and Victoria wrote letters to each other. Tawny would always say in her letters she was waiting for Victoria. While in the center, Victoria was given the news that her mother had an aggressive cancer and she didn't have much longer to live. However, when the time came for Victoria to be released, she went right to Tawny and not her ailing mother. And yes, as a mother, this really bothered me. Go see your mother, kid. But Tawny was first and foremost on Victoria's mind. It seemed they were equally smitten with one another, and a relationship, no, an actual domestic partnership formed between the two young women. Many of Tawny's friends began to drift away from her when she got together with Victoria. They didn't really like Victoria much, and they didn't think she was good for their sweet Tawny. One friend that hung in there, though, was Lacey. She didn't want to lose Tawny's friendship, and she decided it was just easier to be Victoria's friend, too. When Victoria's mom passed away, Tawny's mom, Dana, invited Victoria to come live with them. Dana felt bad for Victoria losing her mom, so she opened her arms and her home, and she welcomed Victoria in. 
and Dana accepted her as another one of her children. One thing I really love about all of Tawny's parents and family members was their willingness to accept Tawny for who she was and who she loved. And in turn, they loved who Tawny loved as well, without judgment. Tawny's dad, Casey, also accepted Victoria as part of the family. Tawny and Victoria's domestic partnership went on for five years. For two people to get together at such a young age, five years is quite an accomplishment. And as in all relationships, there were some really, really good times. And there were some really shitty times. The extent of the shitty times was exceedingly bad. It started fairly early on in the relationship. Victoria had some self-esteem issues, leading to many unwarranted insecurities in her relationship with Tawny. Victoria saw that Tawny had a lot of friends, both male and female. But it was the male friends that Victoria saw as a threat. As I mentioned before, Tawny was fun. She was playful. She never wanted to exclude or isolate anyone, which I guess could be seen as flirtatious by Victoria. Victoria's actions were very controlling of Tawny. If the couple were out at a party, Tawny, of course, would hug and talk to her friends. Victoria would get jealous of Tawny's interactions and let her know that she was behaving like a bad girlfriend. At first, Tawny would make light of it because she loved Victoria. It seemed like almost all of the couple's fights would begin with an enraged, jealous Victoria. The domestic abuse started as emotional, but it swiftly turned to physical as Victoria could not contain her anger. Occasionally, Tawny would get a text from a male friend, like someone she went to high school with, and the text would say something like, Tawny, I miss you. Let's grab coffee sometime. Tawny would have to explain it was just a friend from high school, not a big deal. But it didn't matter. Victoria played out in her head that it was much more, and it would become a big deal. Victoria would rage with jealousy. One day after Tawny received a text such as this, Victoria sucker punched Tawny in the mouth, knocking out one of Tawny's front teeth. Victoria started to immediately tell Tawny how sorry she was, how she didn't mean it. She promised she'd try harder, and she pleaded with Tawny not to tell her family. When the family did ask Tawny what happened to her tooth, Victoria chimed in with the story about how they were jumped by a group of girls. A look was then exchanged between Victoria and Tawny. The look was to let Tawny know she wasn't to state anything different than what Victoria had just said. Life carried on for the two young women, pretty much how it always went. The good times and the bad times with the uncontrollable anger of Victoria. Victoria, in an attempt to get back at Tawny for being so likable and personable, and in Victoria's mind flirting with everyone, especially guys, went and had an affair with a good friend of Tawny's. Okay, maybe it wasn't such a good friend. Not if the good friend allowed it to happen. Then after the affair and Tawny finding out and not wanting anything to do with Victoria, Victoria made and posted a video on YouTube pleading for Tawny's forgiveness. She kept saying how she wanted Tawny to belong to her again. Instead of seeing this as fucked up and a red flag because no one should ever own anyone, Tawny saw it as a sweet gesture and forgave Victoria. For over two years, Tawny's mom allowed Victoria to live in her house. She was unaware of the domestic abuse happening to her daughter right under her own roof. By now, Tawny had landed herself a sweet job as an accountant in Salt Lake City, and Victoria, unemployed, was helped by Tawny's mom to find a job as a security officer. Tawny's dad was even helping Victoria purchase a uniform for her new job. And although he lived in a different home, he too was unaware of the abuse happening towards his daughter. But if a family isn't expecting their child to be abused, They won't be looking for signs of it. Tawny's parents knew who they raised. A strong girl with a high self-esteem normally. How could they possibly have known the abuse was going on if Tawny wasn't acting any different towards them? And Victoria was a good actress and a liar. From my past experiences, nobody in my family really knew of the mental and emotional abuse that I endured in a long-term relationship. So when my daughter was of age, I started to drill it in her head. 
if whoever you are dating ever so much as angrily touches you, you have to leave that person forever. Because if they get away with it once and you forgive them, you're enabling them to start a very unhealthy pattern towards you. The same would go for it if they try to control you mentally or emotionally. No one ever talked to me about domestic abuse. I wish somebody would have. 43.8% of lesbian women and 61.1% of bisexual women have experienced rape, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner at some point in their lifetime. And that's just the cases reported. Those statistics are even higher than that of heterosexual women. On October 17, 2014, Tawny and Victoria drove from their home in Holiday, which is the suburb of Salt Lake they lived in, to Ogden, Utah, and that is where Victoria was from. They'd been invited to a party. The party was a typical party. Alcohol and weed was present. Tawny partook in both. Victoria, from what I read, partook in the drinking but not the weed. This was because of her new job as a security guard. They did drug tests. In the early morning hours of now October 18th, the young couple left the party and they started their eh, about an hour or so trip back to Holiday Salt Lake area. Tawny was driving with Victoria in the passenger seat. The young women did not even get out of Ogden when Victoria started her same shit, different day, jealous raging. Not even asking Tawny to pull over for a second, Victoria pulled out a knife she carried with her, and she started stabbing Tawny in the face, head, and chest. She then somehow got behind the wheel and guided the car to a church parking lot in West Ogden, a church she attended as a child. She stopped the car, got out, and proceeded to call her sister Cindy. She told Cindy she hurt Tawny real bad. Cindy arrived at the church parking lot, saw Tawny slumped over in the car and called 911. When emergency services arrived, Tawny was pronounced dead on the scene. Victoria was apprehended and taken to the police station. Victoria claimed Tawny, while driving, smacked her and pulled her hair, and that's why Victoria snapped. Mind you, Lacey, Tawny's friend, never saw Tawny ever get physically aggressive towards Victoria. Which, of course, makes me feel Victoria's lying the same way she lied about what happened to Tawny's tooth. A medical examiner said Tawny was stabbed 46 times. Many of the wounds were superficial, but it was still an exorbitant amount. The proverbial overkill, if you will. It was determined that Tawny died from shock and bleeding out, which to me means If Victoria had tended to Tawny's wounds after inflicting them, she might have been able to keep Tawny alive until EMT arrived and they could take over. I think Victoria killed Tawny twice, first by inflicting the wounds and second by just letting her bleed out. Victoria was charged with first-degree murder. She was held without bail until her preliminary trial. A psych evaluation was ordered on Victoria. But the final ruling was that Victoria was mentally fit to stand trial for the murder of her girlfriend. In November of 2015, over a year after Victoria attacked and killed Tawny, her trial wrapped up. During the trial process, she had several outbursts, including one where she threatened suicide because everyone was against her. Victoria pleaded guilty of murdering her girlfriend, Tawny Baird. On the stand, speaking to Tawny's family and the judge, Victoria admitted, I'm the monster here. During the victim impact statements, Tawny's dad, Casey, pleaded with the judge, give Victoria a life sentence with no possibility of parole. Tawny's aunt said, jealousy is the devil and it will kill. It's Vicky's fault. She stabbed her and killed her. Why should she get one free day to be with the trees in the sky when Tawny cannot? Victoria's sentence was 16 years to life. Her first parole hearing is scheduled 2039, which will have been 24 years served. 
Is this a fair sentence for taking another young life? If Tawny were my daughter, I'd say fuck no. Another question I have. Will Victoria be reformed after she is considered for parole? Again, my naysayer self believes she's not going to receive the anger management training or any skills that could help her not to snap again when she gets jealous or mad. Therefore, she's still going to be a danger to society and to any future woman she might get with. If Victoria were able to get that type of service in prison to help her with her anger and impulse control, then maybe, just maybe, parole would be okay. But not after 24 years. 24 years for taking the life of a beautiful young woman destined to do great things in life. Personally, I hope she doesn't get out. And yes, I'm not a crime junkie. I'm a crime judgy. Thanks for listening, Rainbow Warriors. I love you guys. Remember, it's not a crime to be gay. Unless you're a murderer. <laughs>